what is music? Music is something that it teaches me so much about my psychology, most of all, and it teaches me how to improve. And nothing like music can keep me here in the moment, which is a spirit, a spiritual uh, discipline, right? Being here now with what you have and kind of do what you do. Hello and welcome. Uh, I'm here uh, with Mr. Mr. Henrik Andersen, uh, guitarist, composer, conacolist, and he does many, many other things which he will speak about. Um, Henrik, uh, if you don't know Henrik, Henrik was one of the first people to introduce uh, Conaco to YouTube. And uh, I personally uh, watched a lot of his early clips and that's how I got into Conaco. So Henrik, thank you so much for uh, 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 being on the show and uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Maybe a good place to start is if you can tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, where you are from, when did you start playing and, and about your musical uh, beginnings. Okay, just stuff me if it's too long. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll do that. Uh, I basically uh, started to, to play uh, music as a young man uh, because, uh, yeah, I was attracted to music very early uh, and I was uh, always trying to make my own music. And I have been able actually since I was young to compose my own music and I had this uh, ability to uh, to check out what people did. Uh, I was so curious about, for example, my first musician that I really loved was Mark Knopfler from Dire Strait. And at that time, you, you uh, had to take the cassette tape and put it into a tape recorder and slow down the speed and, you know, learn all this uh, all these fantastic solos and then create my own music inspired from that i never performed any of it and this was kind of my basic uh, i just enjoyed doing music and when i was in my early 20s i went to the music conservatory um, because i found that i could make a career possibly to uh, to uh, teach music and play music and during that time uh, at the Rhythmic Music Conservatory in Copenhagen, I was studying from 90 to 95. Uh, during that time, I realized I learned so much about scales and harmony. I learned to orchestra for big band and all this amazing stuff. But speaking of rhythm, there was no method at all to teach uh, rhythm. Uh, at that point, it, uh, the rhythmic training was pretty much to play a drum kit or a dance, uh, African dance. They hired some Africans that came, you know, and show us stuff and we would play congas and it was amazing. <laughs> but also a bit frustrating because um, there was what to do about this. And at the same point, I would, I would be listening to uh, Shakti records of John McLaughlin. And I just noticed that there was this amazing, uh, this amazing uh, ability to sing rhythms. And I, at the same time, I discovered Trilla Gurtu uh, when he was playing with John McLaughlin. And I think, wow, this is amazing. I have no idea that it was a language. I was just attracted and I was puzzled about how is this possible? How can these guys know? Because at that time, um, I was also producing my first album in the, uh, in 99 with my group and I went into the studio and I had my first trauma. Uh, I paid a fortune. I sold my apartment to make my first record and we went into this fantastic studio and I've, we have been touring so I know this music uh, by heart. But what happens in the studio is if I was playing the guitar and, you know, the, the technician took down all the other tracks, the drums and the keyboards, and I heard my guitar playing alone. And I was thinking, my God, I, I, I was kind of, you know, puzzled. What, what the fuck is going on? I was kind of thinking, my God, it, it, at least the drummer keeps the beat. 
But I realized what I was playing, what was not what I was hearing. It was not my intentions. And at that point, I figured out, wow, what to do? And at some point, um, years went by, and I still had this kind of mysterious about some why were some musicians magical if they had this kind of security and i figured out you know if i was playing a blues i was trying to stretch the blues and always at some ah oh, shit where am i i lost my uh, timing and at some point i was uh, finishing my um, my conservatory and i was uh, transcribing uh, the guitar concerto from john mclaughlin and luckily, the, the 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 chief of the conservatory, he was a friend of Michael Gibbs, who orchestrated uh, who orchestrated this uh, this um, piece of music. And he said to me, "Hey, Michael Gibbs, owe me a favor." So he picked up the phone and he called, saying, "You will have the full score in a, in a week." And I was mind that that was mind blowing. So I studied this and learned this, and in that process. I met uh, John McLaughlin. Uh, he was touring with the Free Spirit, Danish Chambers, and Joey Di Francesco. And I was uh, traveling after him and seeing some shows and had some <clears throat> some short interviews with him. And before I had my interviews, I remember Danish Chambers. He was sitting and says, "My God, John McLaughlin has such an amazing timing." And still in my world, I think. What do you mean? He's a guitar player. <laughs> so I was kind of, I was kind of puzzled. What, what, what is it? And I met John and told him I would, um, I would perform his guitar concerto. And he says, "Wow, good for you." And I say, "Is there anything you can, you know, can you give me an advice?" And at that, that time, he said, "I think you should check out Connor Call, learn Connor Call, and study that." It's probably the best advice I ever had because I started to, at that point, was it was before you could Google anything. I tried my network to find out where, who knew Connor Cole. And at some point I was ready just to go to India and live in a cave because I figured out this is, this is the stuff. Uh, and I've, some of my friends uh, have heard about a guy in London, Pete Lockett, who actually were, had an education in this. So I wrote to uh, Pete Lockett and that was, um, that was the first connection. He was my first teacher and I'm so happy because he was, I'm kind of happy he was not Indian because he had this bridge between where I were and where I wanted to go. And I think he was, he was, yeah, we just, we, the chemistry were good. I would so admire what he did. And I think he would think, wow, this guy just loves Connor Cole. And so I came to London and I maybe I was there uh, one week at a time for some years and I took his lesson. And I just, I remember my first lesson with him. I remember I recorded everything and wrote it out. I just remember I had 20 minutes and I had a headache. It was totally overload in my chips. I remember he, he said to me uh, like this and wait a minute. <laughs> and from there I, I studied that more and more. And I realized at that point that Conocal was was kind of non-existing in the public space. So I I really had this you know this kind of feeling I want to I really want to dedicate my life to that because there's an opportunity here this system is amazing and nobody knows about it what if instead of just being a fusion guitar player what if I went deep in and really tried to figure out for my, for myself how this works and how to uh, tell people about it. So I had this kind of commitment and still studying with Pete, I started traveling to India and uh, I bought, I found some bookshops and I bought 
all the books I could find. In some cases, I came home with suitcases full of books. And I was trying, and it was so confusing because it's an oral tradition. So you would find different pronunciations of, for instance, five. Taka takita, tati kita tum, tati gena tum, tati kita tum. All kinds of... And I think, well, the basic is it's five. Five is the idea. And in that process, I wrote my first book and uh, did the videos uh, just to try to empty my head and see how is this coming out. And I figured out, wow, it's what actually is good to be. Uh, it like the uh, I became kind of focused because I could see where this was going, and it's like. Yeah, Conakal was, it's, it's like learning a language. Um, just a side note, for instance, now I'm learning Italian. And I've been doing that for for almost a year. And at the beginning, it's the same thing with Conakal. It's words. You, you imitate these sounds and you know what, and you can start building structures. And at some point, your brain actually have desires to express I want a cup of coffee or longer things that work. And for that, that happens also with Conakal. At some point, I was trying to, uh, I, I could uh, express ideas. And I also took a decision that I know that it's a fantastic culture, the Carnatic music uh, form where the Conakal derives from. But I decided not to... Um, I decided not to uh, to to go Indian. I wouldn't become an Indian musician, but I would learn the dialect and try to take it uh, to express myself. And shortly after that, in the, the late nineties, I was uh, I met Trilla Gurtu, and uh, he he wanted me to become uh, a musician in his group and uh, study with him. And that kind of, uh, for me, that finalized my circle of searching because uh, Trilla Gorta was kind of the opposite uh, of Pete Lockett in so many ways. Uh, both of them are amazing percussionists and groove masters, but um, Trilla Gorta had another uh, approach uh, to that. And also a different, totally different psychology. <laughs> uh, and uh, he, he really, uh, I would say Trillac really uh, was passionate about what I was doing with him. And he was saying, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. Practice, practice. And he wouldn't give me uh, any uh, information. I wanted to study, but he said, no, 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 no. And, the, and upon some point, I figure out that after we were touring, we were on a, for example, we were touring one and a half month in Europe. I figured out that Trilak, uh, he had a lot of friends coming and he liked to have some wine. And when they were drinking wine, these guys, the Indians and all, they would battle Conakal. And now I'm revealing kind of a secret. I knew that Trilak wouldn't show me any of this. So I had a little bag with a microphone and I just pushed it in. And I recorded all these nights, and um, and, and and years after, that, I would transcribe that and learn the compositions and understand the logic of it. Because at that point, I was beginning to see uh, patterns. We're speaking like we are speaking of language. I could see these greater patterns, and I think, wow, oh, this is super interesting. And at some point, ending my career with uh, Trilog in the in the after some years, I figure out now I know exactly what to do from now on and the rest of my life. I have found uh, a way to work. And at that point, I started to uh, create systems, uh, which I think was was the the thing needed to, to have an identity that you think this is interesting. Okay, I write this down, I do a program. So it's, I thought about it making a little garden. You see a field and then here I have my tomatoes and I have to go every day and 
you know, Dodo. And the same here. Here I have five, here I have nine, here I have seven, all this thing. And I would do programs every day. So this is how I got sucked into Connor Call and yeah. um, started practicing. Yeah, that's really fascinating, you know. And from the other side, I'm the one who saw your first clips. Mm. And, uh, you know, I think that's that's going back to like... 14 or 15 years ago, maybe maybe 13 years ago, something like that. Can I, I... Have a, I have a video, which is uh, YouTube is from 2006, I think. That's right, yes. And I actually made my first video in 99. Oh, really? Okay. So, so there is uh, the first basic kind of call video is actually from 99. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that was my way in as well. And, mm. you know, it, it's interesting what you're saying. I relate to so much of what you are saying in the process of becoming a musician, going to the studio, recording, and then all faders out except you. And you're going, oh, my God, what is what is going on here? This is just mumble yeah, yeah. and fumble. So I got to work this out. And especially when you're in a situation like this, when you're under pressure, so you you're recording your own album like like your experience or maybe when you're playing mm. with people that you care about a lot and you care about playing with and, and then you say oh i'm behind let me see what i can do with this and mm. you know for me it was very very similar process and uh, i think uh, um, up until then i was really looking in the dark just trying to look for anything that will help me. I remember I used to vocalize, just vocalize the instrument, which really helped me a lot, mm. but um, which I learned from, uh, uh, from different people, um, uh, especially from Bob Moses, by the way. Bob who, Moses, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have to say that uh, Bob, May, Bob Moses gave me a, a, a revelation. I hang out with him for one week, uh, pff, more than, yeah, maybe 12 years ago. And I, to be honest, I didn't really know about him. I didn't really know that he was the drummer from the first Pat Metheny album. That's right. But we were walking We were walking in some fields in Denmark. I took him to, a, we, we bought some beer and this is, and had an amazing, some amazing days. But I remember at some point he was, had this, he, would, he was kind of this, uh, I have two or three drummers in my head. And he was in, And he would like sing three dramas at the same time. And I was just, wow. Yeah. And no matter, he was trying to destroy time. And that was, for me, that was fascinating. But, but I could hear and feel that no matter what he did, he was always in time. That's right, yeah. He had this internal, that's what he was trying to, you know, get across to me as well. Have that internal timekeeper with, within you so you yeah. don't have to worry about anything else. You know, you inside yeah. of the, this is what you, he, he told me, inside of you, there's another Henrik who is mm. keeping the time for you, but you don't need to worry about it. You, do, you can do whatever yeah. you like around that. And that, even that's, even that's, Steve Gadd, I saw Steve Gadd, uh, one of my favorite drummers, I saw him do a short clip where he was showing some drama stuff and they were sitting and listening to him. And, I, and he said, okay, uh, try to count here. And he, he started, you know, shuffling around the beat. And at some point he says, you know, the most important thing is to keep time. <laughs> the most, and, and that is the fact the, uh, to be able to be in time mm -hmm. and in, in so many uh, in so many ways that is the truth and about music uh, because I also have this concept of music being a, what is music music is something that it teach me so much about my psychology most of all and it teach me how to improve and nothing like music can keeps me here in the moment which is a spirit a spiritual uh, Discipline, right? Being here now with what you have and kind of do what you do. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, but, but it's really amazing. Uh, back, uh, getting back to the uh, conical thing, um, how you know people like you in in the early days just took this conical and made it 
uh, a super valuable tool for Western musicians who are looking to either develop the rhythm if they already got good rhythm or to, to you know, greater uh, uh, heights or someone who has uh, maybe difficult and we all have, we all have difficulty in rhythm mm. you know and, and because rhythm is so vast isn't it and and then you know with conical you can just step by step first of all you can see what's going wrong and then second you can just step by step like practice this uh, and and really improve your your sense of internal timekeeper, so to speak, like uh, uh, like we spoke earlier. Mm. And I think you were one of the first people, or the first people, the first guy who taught me that through your first video. And so, uh, I mean, I owe you big thanks for that. And uh, it's uh, and ever th- ever since I've been uh, using Conacol as a tool. For, for my own practice, but also to give people, you know, some a toolbox to, mm. to give people that might be otherwise really great musicians, but have uh, a, a, a challenges with their rhythm. You know, in the West, we mm. like to, we, we the, the Western music is not based on rhythm. You know, when you look at history, but it's not, it's not such a focused, thing in uh in western music but it depends i think it depends on uh i mean i think there are there in serious any serious music will have uh this is about getting deeper into if you for example see a le sacre de printemps and if you have to play that music, you have to have rhythm yes yeah absolutely but no what i meant is actually something else that is de- definitely valuable valid point but also in the west right now we like to play funk we like to play jazz we like to play latin music you know there's all these <clears throat> things coming all these other musics coming from different worlds yeah. that have a, a very very strong ryth- rhythmic element to them and i think a lot of uh, i yeah. see that with a lot of my students they are having trouble with that because we're not born or not, you know, born and bred with that uh, rhythmic education, so to speak. No, but for me, also um, a very important thing that happened in my career that changed a lot was uh, I started doing theater, working with theater. I've been doing that for almost 20 years, performing as an actor, uh, being on stage and actually also working with dance companies. And for me, that taking music out of context and putting it somewhere uh, teach me a a lot about, you know, uh, what's actually going on in my body. And I think about related to what you said uh, about these things coming from other cultures. There's a lot of cultures where people actually, uh, the most music is, is, if it has a strong rhythm, is about dancing. So I actually started dancing and I still do dancing. And I actually made some, uh, I made some programs because I realized I have these students that can, they can take all in about the information and kind of call, but at some point there's no, there is something I can hear in the sound that's not connected. And I thought, I know that feeling from my early years and it is, I have the ideas in my, it's kind of here, but it's not in my body. And I think, wow, people are actually, Henrik, I speak to myself, Henrik, music, people are actually dancing to music, you know. You have to get this, you know, into your body and this kind of, because it's the natural state of mind. Children will dance to music if they like it. And if you don't have this connection with your body, then you are... Yeah, it, it it's at least it's it's worth checking out what if you can get deeper into your body because at some point you know from from practicing at some point you feed your body some new material and at some point it becomes body memory it would become a reflex and for me also listening to music has a strong. Uh, 
like sensuality, you know, where I hear music, it's a strong thing for me. So I never really listen to music because it's so powerful. And I get so much information about this, what is happening with these people. And a lot of the time, like modern music, I can actually hear this guy wasn't in the same space at this time. It's like uh, music today is uh, amazing production, but it's like Photoshopping. And what I like is actually the real picture of people being real, playing together, real, having fun and having inspiration. And a conversation, uh, uh, of course. Yeah, uh, spending some time. And I think this is uh, this is the attraction of music, right? It's the sound of people having fun. Great, great. No, that's all, that's all really great, great points you, you made there. And I, I definitely... Uh, um, I agree with with all all you've said. Now, um, tell me. I, I know that you have a lot of uh, coming back to the <clears throat> educational stuff. I know that you have uh, uh, some books and some DVDs uh, available on your website and stuff like that. Could you speak about? Yeah. Uh, could you speak about in relationship to what we spoke? Could you speak about? what you aim to achieve with those courses and books that you've uh, uh, you've written over the years? Yeah. Um, I have uh, the first, I was, I was talking about the, the books that I wrote. Uh, it's called Shortcut to Nirvana. I've got this one. <laughs> yeah. And it was, for me, it was the, the process of uh, reading all those books and trying to see how it would be interesting to have like a tour guide to the Indian music system to explain the, the qualities of counting the beats uh, and how uh, uh, that is, how you can dig into that. And the scale system is amazing. So I made these books about all that. Um, and in this spirit, again, that this is universal, uh, this is universal knowledge. You kind of call and rhythm can be adapted to any music, but also the amazing Indian scale system. Uh, it has a different concept. They have like 72 basic scales. Uh, and that is amazing for any, uh, any tonal player to figure out uh, this system because they don't relate to harmony. They only have melody and rhythm. That's right. So this is the, this is like the book that you can get in my web shop. Um, and after some time, I uh, I started having uh, a lot of um, students online on Skype. And I think, and and that project made me think, wow, why don't I make a video tutorial? And after having 20 years of experience and also doing masterclass, I figured out there is a way to actually start from scratch. So the first video, Learn Conakal, is about uh, keeping time and singing Conakal, starting from the very, very simple. Uh, so you learn the alphabet of Conakal, and then I'm kind of stretching the material so you get uh, an idea in the first video how to do the basic, but also how you can actually do the same thing from a new perspective over and over and over. Yes. Yeah. And I will, uh, I will also, uh, in the description below, I'll, I will make a link uh, to that specific video. And maybe some of your other ones as well, uh, so people can uh, check it out. And I really highly recommend for anyone who is uh, uh, listening to this interview definitely definitely check those out because they are really really valuable rhythmic exercises you can do and a great uh, uh, introduction to conakol as well mm. uh, and and in this series of learn conakol there's three videos now because there was a lot of uh, customers really happy about the first one so i made a second one where I kind of stretch the material from the first one because with Conakal you can keep on sophisticating your vocabulary. And I introduced some uh, the, the T highs and the more complex rhythmic calculations. And in the final one, the third one, I thought maybe people would like to learn a composition, a long composition of mine. And I analyzed the composition and uh, show how I constructed it. And the difference between those videos 
is that they have they are aimed at learning people uh, instead of you uh, for example my videos on uh, YouTube and Facebook a lot of them has to do with showing some a bit showing off but you know showing what inspires me and so if people see those videos they think wow this is super complex but my videos will really take you from the beginning back to where I started and show you my uh, evolution. That's great. And I and again, I haven't seen those three uh, Learn Cornacle videos, but I'm sure they uh, they are, you know, judging from uh, these other videos that I know and also from taking some lessons with you in the, in back in the day that they are definitely, definitely worth uh, checking out. So uh, yeah, mm. I think this uh, this was a, a really uh, great and very informative uh, interview. I really thank you again for for your time, and uh, and again I hope that the, the viewers of this uh, interview will check some of your stuff on your website. There will be a link in the, the description below, so you know everybody feel free to to click on some of these links. Mm. Um, Henry, could you show us? Uh, Maybe a little exercise that one can just uh, somebody who is just starting with conical can do, or maybe um, uh, something. Uh, let's say if uh, if someone knows already some of the basic <coughs> syllables ta taka takita ta diginadom, or maybe uh, uh, the the Muradangam syllables and some of the basic uh, talams. Could you show us a, a little exercise? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I was actually thinking about a fun exercise. Maybe I think it's 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 very useful because it really has nothing to do with Conakal, but it's to, but it's to keep time. So, like when we are when we are speaking, we have to listen to what we say and we have to use our memory. But also, you can keep time in the same place. So try to keep the talon and try to have a conversation and talk about your favorite subject. Try to describe what's around you. Because actually this is what we train when we train Conakal, is like multitasking. You have to be able to have the task of keeping the time, uh, time signature and not lose any beats. And at some point this needs automation. And I think it's kind of important to practice this without actually practicing Conakal. So you have to keep the beat at every time. Great. <laughs> Fantastic. That's a really very original uh, uh, exercise. I never tried that. <laughs> this, this exercise is, uh, is just an old one, and it's very fun uh, because it's about spacing the, the phrase takadimi and mainly doing it uh, in tempo and going in half tempo. And from there, there is a rule that you go triplets. So you go triplets to the next layer, which is even, and then triplets and even, triplets even, a faster, faster tempo. But the first, the first beat would be like, ka, ka, di, ni, ka, ka. Half speed, ka, ka, di, ni, and ka, ka, di, ni. Da, ka, di, mi. 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 Da, no, but yeah, the, the, the internet connection was overwhelmed by the, the speed. <laughs> it's too, too strong. <laughs> yeah, it's too, too fast. Man. But I think this is just fun because it shows that you can go from really, really slow to really fast. And at some point you realize that going really slow is the hardest thing. Sometimes it is, definitely, yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah.
So uh, again, thank you, Henrik, for your time. And uh, I hope this is uh, first of uh, not. I hope this is not the last inter interview we are doing. And uh, keep safe. And yeah. uh, I hope uh, I'm looking forward to hear more from you online and uh, and to meet you sometime, hopefully uh, in uh, in Denmark. <laughs>